many of you are worshiping online with us as well. Easter Sunday is always such a great celebration, but the reality is we live in the knowledge of our risen reigning king, and that makes every Sunday an important celebration. We're glad you're here. We're starting a new sermon series. We hope you come every week. We really want you to be a part of it. Today is a big day for supporting youth missions here at Calvary Church. We have their one time a year thing called a tag sale. We're down in our atrium at the other end of the building. They have baked goods and crafts and other things that people have donated for you to purchase to support our youth mission summer trips. And you don't have to wait and bid on anything. You like something, you pay for it, you go. Also, this is an impact grill Sunday, so you can have omelets or waffles made to order, and the, pri the proceeds from those also go to support our youth. So we encourage you not to just make the service your morning, but to make sure you get down to that end of the building and participate in everything going on down there as well. Well, as we come off of Easter Sunday and as we look forward to every celebration of Jesus, our reigning King, Let's hear these verses together from the book of Hebrews, the first chapter. The sun radiates God's glory and expresses the very character of God. And he sustains everything by the mighty power of his command. When he had cleansed us from our sins, he sat down at the place of honor at the right hand of the majestic God in heaven. Where he reigns today, let's stand and worship him together.
proclaim the name of Jesus.
Let's reflect together this morning on Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. Instead of the joy meant for him, he endured the cross. Ignoring its shame, he was betrayed for money, abandoned by his best friends, dragged before Pilate, beaten without mercy, and nailed to a cross. His sacrifice has redeemed us. Would you pray with me as we prepare for the Lord's Supper? Lord, you have truly borne our sorrows. Lord, you have carried our griefs. You have forgiven our sins as your body was pierced for our iniquities. Lord, we come to you this morning to confess, to reflect, and to remember. Thank you for your transforming work in our lives through Jesus Christ and through his sacrifice. Meet us here in this place. Meet us here at this table. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Communion at Calvary is open to all who are followers of Jesus, who have come to him for forgiveness and a new beginning. We gather this morning as a body of Christ to remember his sacrifice. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me.
take the bread and remember his sacrifice. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for the forgiveness of sin. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Take the cup and remember his sacrifice. When we are on a journey together as a church, and guess what? Every single church is. Every single church is on a journey to find out what God wants for them, what God has for them, how God wants to use them in this world. And today we embark on a new series called Rooted, and it's a look into Ephesians about who we are rooted in Christ. 
and what Jesus' plan for Calvary Church is, who Jesus wants us to be. And this morning, coming to us from our Moy Bear campus is our high school pastor, Sam Townsend. Good morning. Uh, my name's Sam. I'm the senior high pastor here at Calvary. I could be with you this morning. Uh, between 2004 and 2010, ABC ran a hit show called Lost. Uh, it was a science fiction series about plane crash survivors who were trying to escape this remote island. And over the course of six seasons, lots of mysterious storylines emerged. Uh, there was a smoke monster. There were whispers in the woods. There were strange reoccurring numbers. Uh, an out-of-place polar bear. Uh, alternate realities, of course. And a button that needed to be pushed every 108 minutes or the world would end. And while it's had millions of viewers, it had a huge budget. For its time, it had great CG effects. The, the major qualm, the major complaint at the end of it all was that there were a lot of mysterious plot points that didn't resolve meaningfully and some that just didn't resolve at all. Somewhere in the threads of the story, it kind of came a little loose. And now you can find entire corners of the internet just dedicated to wondering and more often ranting about these unfinished storylines of lost. What was the purpose? What was the plan? What was the storyline of Lost supposed to wrap up in, and especially all these little areas? In your own life plan, in your own story, have you ever felt lost? Like, sometimes things just don't make sense. They don't line up like the way you'd like them to. Are there any uh, loose threads that dangle out of your storyline and make you wonder why? How does this part of my story make any sense at all? For what mysterious reason does it make sense that I have in my life sickness or loss or hardship or struggle? How is that part of the plot of my story? Why do good things happen to bad people? Why do bad things happen to good people? What's the meaning of a violent history and an uncertain future? And how does my story make sense in all the midst of this? And, and why do my plans often seem to not get realized? They, they get lost in the way. Uh, in 1785, there's a poet, Robert Burns, uh, and he put to verse how big plans and small plans can often not uh, come to completion. They, good things are promised, but bad things result. As I read this excerpt from his poem, To a Mouse, listen to how he worries over his past and he fears about his future. But mouse friend, you are not alone in proving foresight may be vain. The best laid schemes of mice and men go off to rye and leave us only grief and pain for promised joy. Still, friend, you're blessed compared with me. Only present dangers make you flee. But ouch, behind me I can see grim prospects drear, while forward-looking seers we humans guess and fear. That's a familiar line in there, right? The best laid schemes or the best laid plans of mice and men. That line of mice and men would later become a John Steinbeck novel that in part was about not relying too heavily on your dreams because they might not work out. Do your plans ever fall apart? Do your dreams ever fail? 
Uh, Does the thread of your story get lost in the reality of everyday life? Well, today I want to start with an acknowledgement and a proposal. Um, What I want to acknowledge is this. Your story probably won't make a lot of sense on its own. As the main character of your story, you'll see dangling threads, unrealized dreams, unresolved plot points, entire storylines that don't seem anchored in any kind of meaning. That's the bad news. But here's the good news. Here's the thing I want to propose to you today. That's this. Your story will make sense when it's rooted in God's plan. Your story will make sense when it's rooted in God's plan. And that sounds pretty good, right? Like, I think we could do an ad campaign around that. I think we could put that on a billboard and say, hey, move on over to God's plan today. And some of you here would be the first in line. But others of you might be a little discerning, maybe skeptical of new trends, or in in this case, like super old theology. Um, You might want to take God's plan out for a test drive, look under the hood, kick the wheels a little bit before you buy And so that's what I want to do today. Um, I want to take a look at God's plan. I want to do that through the lens of Ephesians 1, 3 through 14. Now, over the next few weeks, we're going to spend a lot of time in Ephesians. And so let's just kind of get our bearings here. Uh, Ephesians is a letter written to the early church by the Apostle Paul. Uh, Years earlier, Paul had visited Ephesus and and encouraged the people there. And now he is in prison in Rome, and he's writing them a letter again to encourage them and to remind them, hey, you should be rooted in Christ. So the letter opens with this poetic prayer. It it recounts God's faithfulness over time. And we're going to read that opening today. Uh, It's As I read Ephesians 1, 3 through 14, here's what I want you to do. I want you to listen for what it tells you about God's plan. And we're going to read the whole thing, and then we're going to go back and kind of comb through and pick a few pieces out. So here it is, Ephesians 1, starting at verse 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world, to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of his grace that he lavishes on us. With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which is purposed in Christ. To be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. In him, we were chosen, having been predestined according to that plan of him who works out everything in conformity and the purpose of his will, in order that we who are the first to put our hope in Christ might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. So there's a lot there, right? Uh, That passage is thick with language of worship And it's also um, got some pretty significant theological undertones, too. And there's a lot we could glean from those words. There's a lot we could dig into. But what I want to do today is just point at five things uh, that tell us something about God's plan. So we're going to jump right in. The first thing in this passage um, is that I think it's saying that God's plan is ingrained. God's plan is ingrained. Buying a house is different than building a house, right? When you buy a house, you need to move your family, yourself, into the rooms provided. You need to fit into those spaces. Actually, my house, we didn't just have to fit into the rooms provided. The house needed to fit into the neighborhood. And here's what I mean. There's a picture of the front of my house. Um, But the funny thing is, the front of my house didn't always used to be the front of my house. Let me show you. There's a picture of the back of my house that actually looks a lot more like the front of a house 
because it used to be the front. Uh, if you go down in Roseville, right along Highway 36 where I live, all the houses faced the wrong way. Uh, but the road plan changed, and so the houses had to actually fit into the neighborhood to meet the new plan. Now, when we build a house, when we build a house, we don't have to fit into the rooms. The rooms fit around us. The rooms fit around our, our family. Um, what's, what you want your spaces to look like, what you want your future to look like, you build those rooms. And the thing is, I could tell a lot about you from the house that you built. I could tell something about you if there's extra, if you built in extra chair space in the kitchen, if you built extra garage space, a four-car garage, if, if I looked at your deck and there's a special nook just for the grill, if you built that, I'd know something about you. I'd, I'd know something if you built uh, a nursery just off the main bedroom. I would know something about you if there was a flap in your back door where the dog could get in and out. Um, your family plan would be ingrained in the structure of your house. And the thing is, God didn't retrofit uh, creation to fit his plan. He didn't have to go back and change things. Here's what it says in verse 4 of Ephesians 1. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. It means before God said, let there be light, he had his people in mind. God's plan is ingrained in creation. That means we can look at creation and we can know something about God, something about his family plan. What does our ongoing need for food and sleep tell us about reliance? What does our desire for the closeness of relationships tell us about our need to be close with God? What does the changing of seasons tell us about renewal? God built our house around his plan, which means... Um, that the imprint of his plan is ingrained in the earth and the sky and the fish and the birds and the animals and the sun and the moon and, and in the land and sea and in us. Um, just like if you had a dog door at the back of your house, that wouldn't be an accident. That wouldn't be a happy coincidence. No, that'd be a plan. Um, the way we were made is not a coincidence. We were made to be in relationship with the God who wants to be in relationship with us. It is part of God's plan that was ingrained at the very beginning. Here's the second thing about God's plan from this passage. It's immoderate. It is immoderate. Uh, moderate means uh, average in amount, intensity, quality, degree. It's kind of middle of the road. Um, if your doctor said, if your doctor recommended some moderate exercise, they'd probably be saying, hey, go for a walk, um, you know, get, get some exercise, get out, maybe go to the gym a little bit. They're probably not saying, go play, uh, plan for a marathon. If you drink a moderate amount of coffee, uh, you probably drink a cup a day. Some of you are engaging yourself right now. Uh, if, I own a moderately priced car. It wasn't extravagantly expensive, but it wasn't dirt cheap. It was, it was a moderately priced car. I would not describe God's plan for us as moderate, particularly in cost. Here's what verses 8 and 9 say. Listen to what God's plan cost. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace. Um, just to hear it again in a different way, the New Living Translation says it like this. He is so rich, God is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and he forgave our sins. Now, if God had an asset manager, I imagine that if he brought that plan to his asset manager, that person would say, oh, I don't know, God. I don't know about this. Uh, maybe, maybe we choose a more moderate plan. I'm not sure that this is a reliable investment, the people of earth. And yet, spoiler, uh, God chooses to save the people of earth. He chooses to save us. What we celebrated last week on Easter wasn't a happy accident. It wasn't, it wasn't a coincidence. It was no accident that Jesus suffered and he died on the cross and then he rose from the dead. It was a major plot point in God's plan, the story that God's been telling since before the creation of the earth. The great cost was part of a beautiful plan, and it was immoderate. The third thing is God's plan for us is illuminating. 
Do you remember when Jesus said this? He said, um, I am darkness, I am night. You guys remember that passage? Oh, no. Sorry, that's actually a Batman quote. Um, we get those things confused sometimes. Here it is. Here's what Jesus said. I am the light of the world. I am the light of the world. God isn't a God of darkness. He's, he's a God of light. He is all about illuminating the path ahead of us, letting his people in on his plan, making them part of it. Jesus followers who spent a lot of time with Jesus uh, began to understand his plan. In Matthew 13, after telling his disciples another parable, uh, Jesus points out that not everyone understands his plan. In Matthew 13, starting in verse 11, the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, but not to them. Though seeing, they do not see. Though hearing, they do not hear or understand. But blessed are your eyes because they see and your eyes because they hear. Spending time with Jesus illuminated his disciples' minds and this illumination would transform them into the leaders of the early church. In Ephesians 1, uh, 8b through 10, here's what Paul writes. He says, With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times reached their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth and under, uh, under Christ. God's plan isn't to leave his people in, in the dark but to make known to his followers the mystery of his will. Now, when we know the story of Scripture, when we spend time with God, when we have the Holy Spirit living within us, we begin to understand the workings of God's plan. And the beautiful thing about God's plan is that there's always more to know. And it is a plan that does not disappoint. It gives us a hope. It gives us a future. Because God's plan is illuminating. Uh, God's plan for us is also inclusive. In verse 10, we just read this passage that said um, that God's plan is to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth and under the earth. So there's already some strong inclusion vibes in this passage. But let me point out something else in this passage that I think is interesting. Notice the pronouns in verses 3 through 12. He has blessed us. God chose us. He predestined us. His glorious grace, which he has freely given us. We have redemption. Grace he lavished on us. He made known to us the mystery. We were also chosen. We might be for the praise of his glory. In these verses, Paul is reciting the history of God's faithfulness, and particularly God's faithfulness to Abraham's descendants, who God had a covenant with. But in verse 13, he shifts his focus to the people of Ephesus and more broadly to non-Jews everywhere who are believing in Jesus. Verse 13 says this, And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of, the, of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. God's plan is not just for Jews. It's for Gentiles. And that's really good news for Ephesians living in the first century. And I want you to know today, God's plan isn't just for Jews and Ephesians living in the first century. It's also for Minnesotans living in 2024. And it's for North Dakotans too and South Dakotans. And if you can believe it, it's for Packer fans. And uh, it's for people with all sorts of shades of skin. And it's for people with different physical and cognitive abilities. And it's for people who have a lot and people who have nothing. And it's for children, and it's for teenagers, and it's for adults, and it's for people on both sides of the political aisle, and it's especially for people who are hurting and who are maybe lost in their own story, who are protagonists without a plot. And I could have just, I think, said like what Paul said, it's, it's for Jews, and it's for those who are not Jews, which is to say it is for everyone. Our role is to hear the message of truth. It's the truth that we celebrated on Easter last week, that God came to earth as a man, lived a perfect life we could not live, paid a price that he didn't deserve to pay. He paid our price on the cross, uh, the price of death. And to show his victory over death, three days later he rose, and he's now seated in heaven. Um, and, and that is the message of truth that Paul writes about. 
the gospel of your salvation. And when you believe, when you confess with your mouth, when you believe in your heart, then you are written into that plan. You are included in the story that God is telling. God's plan is inclusive. The fifth thing about God's plan is that it is incomplete. Here's how the passage, the verses we're reading today end in verse 14. It says, The Holy Spirit is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of all those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. I really appreciate how this passage highlights God's long plan and it, it points at Christ's significance in that plan and it now points at the Holy Spirit as a deposit. Uh, the, the New Testament describes the Holy Spirit as the presence of God that uh, resides within those who believe and are saved. If you've received God's forgiveness, then it's made possible by Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, then you know the goodness, the strength, the comfort of the Holy Spirit. It, it's not, but, but the, the goodness of the Holy Spirit that we experience in life is not the conclusion of the story. It's it says it's a deposit. You know what a deposit is, right? It's the first part of the full amount. It's a down payment. It's a taste of what's to come. God's plan is incomplete. There is the promise of a greater inheritance. There is the guarantee of an even closer relationship with God. There's the assurance of something more. I think C.S. Lewis scratches the surface of that something more in the end of his Narnia series. It starts with The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. In the last paragraph of the last book, um, he points at that something more. The narrator follows the characters up to the doorstep of heaven, and then the narrator kind of just gives up and says, I, I don't have the words for this anymore. So he says, The things that began to happen after that were so great and beautiful that I cannot write them. And for us, this is the end of all stories. And we can most truly say that they all lived happily ever after. But for them, it was only the beginning of the real story. All their life in this world and all their adventures in Narnia had only been the cover and the title page. Now, at last, they were beginning chapter one of the great story, which no one on earth has read, which goes on forever, in which every chapter is better than the one before. Our standalone stories don't really hold a candle to the great story God is telling. The never-ending storyline of God's grace. For our pasts, there's forgiveness. For our present, there's grace. For our future, there is hope. But God's story is right now incomplete. But it's going to get there. Now, I have promised five descriptors of God's plan, and that's what I set out to do. But as I reached the end of my study, there was one other thing that kind of jumped out to me, and I was like, how did I miss that? It's like when I point around the room and I say, hey, notice the red in the room, and suddenly red seems to jump out from different places. And you're like, oh, it was there all along. Um, this jumped out at me, and so I'd like to share just one more descriptor, if that's okay. That's this. God's plan for us is in Christ. And why would I say that? It's because Paul says it again and again in this passage. Look, I mean, there's so many places. Some variation of Christ appears 11 times in 12 verses. It's like Paul's trying to tell us something here. And I think what he's trying to tell us is this, that God's plan is possible only in Christ. From the beginning, Christ was the plan. His coming is ingrained throughout the Old Testament. Uh, it's in the prophecy. It's in the narrative. It's through the sacrifice of Christ's blood that we understand how immoderately uh, generous God's plan for grace is. It is in Christ that the goodness of God's plan is illuminated for us. Um, it is in Christ that we find inclusion in God's story, a story that's bigger than ours, a story that ties together loose ends, a story which makes sense only when we relinquish our place as protagonist to God, only when we realize, hey, we're not the hero of our small stories, but we are actors and we are benefactors of a much bigger plan, a, a storyline that's woven its way throughout history and yet is incomplete because the best is yet to come. And your story probably won't make sense. 
on its own. But your story will make sense when it's rooted in God's plan. And maybe you won't see it all yet. Maybe uh, there will be some plot points you don't quite follow. Likely there's still going to be some questions. But when the finale airs, when you're standing there next to Christ, his perspective, I think you'll see the pattern. You'll, you'll recognize um, the reason for the pain. You'll uh, appreciate the plan. So I think the question remains, how do we root ourselves in God's plan? I just want to give you a few ways to begin today. How do we root ourselves in God's plan? First, ingrain Christ in who you are. Ingrain Christ in who you are. Rather than making Christianity an add-on thing, another thing you do, a label that you use, uh, make Christ your center. Make Christ your heartbeat. Make Christ the reason you breathe. What does that look like for you in your life today? Second thing, immoderately love others. Give liberally, forgive quickly, be quick to kindness. If you had an asset manager, uh, make them nervous by how you are generous, you love immoderately with others. Invite God's illumination. Turn off some noise, give up some distraction, slow down, read scripture, talk with God, gather with others to pray, make space for worship. Make space to just listen. Four, include outsiders. Watch for people on the fringes of faith and invite them in. Be like Jesus who sat at tables with all sorts of people. Like Christy told us, Pastor Christy told us a few weeks ago, we need to make space. Um, we need to ask ourselves regularly, hey, who's not in the room? Fifth thing, through the incomplete parts, trust. Uh, we have a foretaste of God's goodness, but there is still heartache and pain and brokenness in the world. Where you see imperfection, pray for God's kingdom to come. Trust God's goodness, even through hardship. Plus, remember all things in Christ. Recognize that you can't do it on your own. Rooting yourself in God's plan requires reliance on Jesus, and you will quickly come to the end of yourself. But there is no end to God's goodness, and remember that in, in Christ, all things are possible. So, at the beginning, near the beginning, I read a poem, um, an excerpt from Robert Burns, who points out that the plans of both mice and men, they don't always work out. And that people often worry about the past a lot, much as they fear the future. And I think the reality is that if we anchor our plans in earth, that's probably the perspective we'll have. But if our story is written in heaven, in Christ, our outlook is different. We find a place in a greater plan. We play a part in a larger story. And so, in the rhyme scheme of To a Mouse, I wanted to close with some hope for Robert Burns uh, and for the rest of us as well. Brothers and sisters, you're not alone. So move by faith into the unknown, for the best laid plans of God have shown that he's worthy of our trust. A wonder that from highest throne he delivers grace to us. For this reason, we find we're blessed, even in the midst of today's mess, even with a past to confess Christ still comes near. Through God's unfailing faithfulness, our future is secure. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for who you are. Thank you for the story you're telling, even now. Thank you that you, um, you give us the gift of including us in the story you're telling. You love us lavishly. You love us immoderately. Uh, I pray that we would experience that love today, that we would know your love, that we would say yes to your plan, that we would relinquish our need to be the hero of our own story, but, but pursue a part in yours. Um, thank you for your goodness even today. Um, I pray that as we uh, step out into the world, um, that uh, we would be reminded that you're 
with us. You are um, guiding us and you are including us in something bigger than ourselves. I'm grateful for that today. Amen. What incredible blessings we have in God and in God's plan. Not just for us individually, but for us as a church together, as we'll continue to hear developed in the next weeks of our series. I've been really anxious to teach this new song to Calvary for a while. It's called Rejoice, and it's by Keith and Kristen Getty, the writers of In Christ Alone. And it just talks about rejoicing in the Lord in every season. Can't think of a better day to start than now. So we're going to introduce it, but we're going to invite you to stand and sing it with us. As soon as you feel comfortable, just start joining in. Let's stand and sing together. participate in communion, hear from God's word. We praise the Lord today that there are people in the community that we are able to help with our community cares offering. And we'll collect that 
for those of you who feel inclined to give as you leave today. I want you to know that in the past weeks, we've been able to help five families with rent assistance. And we've been able to send two kids to snow camp to learn more about Jesus. So those are the kinds of things that our money goes to. Our benediction this morning is from the book of Ephesians. You'll hear this a lot. This is gold. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Jesus Christ through all generations, now and forever. And everyone said, Amen. Amen.